I am Emerald Fennell. I'm Kerry Mulligan, and this is the Screenplay Breakdown. Welcome, Emerald Fennell and Kerry Mulligan to the show. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank, Thank you for having us. We have a scene from Promising Young Woman pulled up, and we'd love for you to break it down for us. Yeah, so this is the scene where Cassie goes to the med school that she'd been at. My assistant says that you are interested in resuming med school. That's right. Like every day on this movie, we had very little time to do it. Uh, And I think we shot this whole thing in an afternoon, which is kind of painful when a scene is 10 pages for the actors, when so much is about the kind of power dynamic between two people and the ebb and flow between them. I left because of what happened to Nina. Hmm. Nina Fisher. You don't remember her? Maybe you remember Alexander Monroe? Carrie, I mean, what's going on through your mind? Like, right before Emerald says action, like, how do you get into the character of Cassandra? I don't know, really. I don't sort of... I think the kind of maybe the positive... The, the, the good thing on this was not really sort of... You know, I think I've in the past I've sort of, you know, found myself kind of standing in the corner of the set with headphones in sort of you know beating myself (laughs) getting ready to do something and actually I think a lot of this was just sort of Emerald and I being really close on stuff and feeling really you know I just felt so comfortable so it didn't feel like a sort of you know the mission is so clear of what Cassie's doing and we had done so much chat in you know the run-up to the film of talking about all of this stuff that it, 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 when we were actually on set on the day, it wasn't there wasn't time really to think too much, and I think that might have been really good actually, just having to go on instinct, um, particularly with a scene like this, which is like you know felt like a real kind of chess game um, that Cassie was obviously winning, but you know it was really sort of instinctive about it and and getting to work with someone like Connie obviously just makes it so much more fun. I think it really helped actually on this movie uh, that we didn't have any rehearsal time. We had like a day, but it was generally kind of just, you know, meeting people and having discussions. But but there was a kind of, actually, it was quite useful, I think, for Connie and Carrie to have a bit of distance, to not be enormously familiar with their, with each other's, you know, with, with each other's personalities for one, but also with how they were going to play it. Mm-hmm. And I think that actually worked in a lot of these scenes in our favor, there's there's a tension there, which is that nobody knows what the other person's quite gonna do. And I, I really do think that's quite important. I think if we'd re- rehearsed that, it would have started to feel like a play or it loses some of its, it loses some of its spontaneity, especially when it's 10 pages and you've been doing it a few times. So Emerald, shooting your first film is difficult enough. I mean, shooting any film is difficult. And on top of that, you were pregnant, correct? Well, I was super pregnant as well. <laughs> you were? Wow. <laughs> the first three weeks after we finished shooting. So I was like a kind of giant, I don't know, God knows what, like a, I don't know, sort of like a ship headed for an iceberg, I guess. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, how did you juggle that? I mean, that's, that's amazing. You know it was fine. It was just completely fine. And I, I think it, partly it was fine because... I loved everyone I was working with so much and it was such a joy and, and you know, there's no time. There's no time. We've got 23 days to shoot something. There's no time to go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. or, you know, worry about eating too many packets of Cheetos and the effect of that more on your unborn child. Like you just, yeah, you just do it. And I think women, and I have said this a lot and it makes me sound very twee, but it is the truth. Women do much harder things, much harder things physically and emotionally absolutely but, so i kind of feel like you know we'll just see it more and more and it's not it's not you know it was it was interesting but it was fine carrie how about you i mean what was that like for you working with a first time director on a big production um yeah i mean a lot of the jobs that i've done in the last little bit have been with first time filmmakers or you know um second time um with their first feature being kind of a small budget thing so I'm not ever really I think I just you know I I felt so uh in such safe hands with Emerald having read the script knowing that you know that script really you know to write that and to conceive of that I think has a there's a huge amount of confidence behind it and once I'd seen the sort of the mood board that Emerald put together and this 
amazing playlist of music, you know, the majority of which, you know, the, the music that you see in the film was all written into the script. So Toxic was in there, Stars Are Blind and um, Something Wonderful. These were all things that I read on the page when she offered me the job. And I just, it was such a kind of full vision that I just didn't, it didn't, it never felt like working with a first time filmmaker. And Carrie, just to like speak into that a little bit more, what exactly brings you that comfort and that confidence from a director? Um, what are nice people, <laughs> firstly. <laughs> I've got pretty, pretty, um, you know, someone can be a complete genius, but if they're not very nice, then I don't really want to go there. Um, but, but yeah, I think just someone who, you know, gives you the, the, you know, first of all, I love having a really close relationship with the director. I love talking endlessly and I like, you know, being able to, you know, like talk through everything through. I think sometimes you can sort of, there's definitely, I've definitely had experiences where I've sort of showed up and like had a crack and not really known if it was right. And I, and I've, you know, and those that can be different and I think have different results, not better or worse. But for me personally, I love the feeling of the two of us being, you know, in line on everything. And, and that's what Emerald and I had, which was so great is that so much of this and so much of, you know, performing this was that Emerald and I was so in tune on who Cassie was and why she was doing what she was doing and who Nina was. And it was like no one else in the whole production really needed to know any of that stuff. Uh, and nor does the audience, but that we did was just so helpful. So I think it's somebody who you can have that with and that you trust enough that you can do, you can go way out of your comfort zone and know that they won't let you fuck it up. <laughs> That's or at least it. they won't end up in the film, you know. Right, <laughs> so, right. Um, you're protected in that sense. Um, but yeah, she just, I had, you know, it was just so, I just had so much faith. It was just so, so it was a, you know, delight, the whole thing. Wow. And beautiful. Carrie, did you have any input as far as like uh, developing Cassandra's character with Emerald? I mean, the, it was, yeah, I mean, everything, you know, was in the script. Um, and then the, you know, as is often the case with the stuff that, that is off camera and that is kind of only really important to actors is the, the conversations that Emerald had where we, you know, what we, which we did collaborate on, you know, figuring out who Cassie was before all of this, but Emerald had very clear ideas about that as well, but it certainly felt like a conversation all of it. Um, and it wasn't kind of like a massively research driven thing. Like lots of these, you know, the majority of the stuff that happens in this film is so tragically common. It was stuff that we grew up with and that we still are surrounded by. So it was really just, being clear on telling the truth about this one one person, you know, and trying to do that justice. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it it's crazy. This is a serious topic, and somehow you've managed to blend in comedy with it. I mean, I found myself laughing a bunch. I just want to know how did you blend those two? It's a funny thing. I think you know, for me, I've never really been able to discuss anything serious in any other way because there's stuff. There's stuff where you kind of have to laugh because it's so dreadful. And I think, you know, almost the best way to communicate so much of this is to, yeah, is to kind of do what Cassie does, I think, which is keep it light, keep it light, keep it accessible, keep it friendly until it's not anymore. And that I think is a sort of crucial element of this movie that it's, you know, it seems to be one thing and it's not quite, but by the time you realize it isn't, you know, it, it's too late. Yeah, like um, like Bo's character, you know, I was like, oh man, it's so, it's so great Cassandra finally has someone in her life that she can trust and she, you know, she can be a friend with. And then all of a sudden, you know, you find out that he was there when she watches the video. And I was just like, oh no, like, I, I, I love that because I was wondering, like, did you, was there ever a moment where you were writing his character and was like, oh, he's going to, he's going to be the good guy. And like he'll be a friend to uh, to Cassie, or did you always have in mind that he was there in the video as well? Um, well, I think I think it's, it's difficult to know precisely because I didn't I don't I write in a very linear way, really. So by the time I got there, there was never a version of this movie where Cassie would be saved by a kind of knight in Paris Hilton armor. Like it just wouldn't. <laughs> It's not true. And I think that the thing with Ryan is that no matter how much we want him to be great, um, it would be so much easier for her to just give in and let go. Mm -hmm. And she does. And, you know, lots of people would argue um, and have argued that what Ryan did was forgivable. You know, she certainly doesn't believe it is. Um, and lots of people don't believe it is. And also, 
you know, so much of it is in his response. All Cassie, the whole way through this movie, is an exercise in her trying to get an apology, trying to get an acknowledgement that the thing that happened wasn't right. Mm -hmm. It's really all she's looking for. And of course, the thing is with Ryan is, when she goes to him, he doesn't say, I'm so sorry. He says, you're gonna forgive me, aren't you? You gotta forgive me. Tell me to forgive me. What am I gonna do? I feel terrible. What am I gonna do if you don't forgive me? And then of course he turns on her. So you know, it's immediately her problem and she's just a crazy bitch. And that is the experience I think of almost every woman who's ever been in a relationship or has ever had somebody grab their ass in a nightclub and when they turn around to say fuck off, the guy turns. Turn around, the same if you do. And then we both won't be doctors, you fucking failure. Nice. Bye, Ryan. And so I think it was really important that Ryan is not above that. He still thinks he's a good guy and she's crazy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? no, yeah, I love when he's coming out, when she's coming out of the nightclub and he's going in to meet a few friends, you're just like, shit, she just fucked up a great relationship. <laughs> Ryan, what are you doing here? I'm meeting friends because my schedule. And I love that because it kind of threw off the scent, like, wow, he, he really is a good guy, you know? Um, and I love how it just gets thrown into her face, you know, and you just, it's heart wrenching. But also, but also there are also lots of warning signs with Brian. Mm. You go back, he keeps turning off, up at her work. She doesn't turn back, he turns up at her work to ask why. She doesn't turn up for a date, he turns up at her house. But you know, this is the thing. It's just, you kind of look and look and look again and Ryan isn't so appealing. Yeah. Emerald, was there ever a moment like, you know, killing off the main character was there ever a moment that you realized like oh my like oh my god like cassie like she's she's gonna die in this script or did you always have the ending planned out from the very beginning or did you kind of like discover that along the way no no i definitely didn't have the ending it, it, it's sort of it, it's important to me i think to kind of go on the journey mm. with her my heart was ripped out when i, I honestly was expecting her to walk out you know someone yeah like someone was gonna come in or she would find she yes yeah, she was so savvy i thought she's so clever and witty she's gonna find her way out of this something she's got an ace under her sleeve something you know and i couldn't believe it and then the one take that you did and i know carrie i i think were you really under the pillow the, like there was no stunt right that was really you yeah it was always um emerald's vision to have it in a single you know single shot so there was no real way of doubling us or using stunt um, team. And we didn't, you know, neither of us, Chris or I wanted to. Um, so we watched a stunt team do it to sort of give a sense of, you know, cause that Emerald knew where the camera, ne you know, needed. It was all, all of that was so mapped out. Just we need to get our bodies into the right place and, and do it sort of realistically. So the, the stunt team did it. And I remember us all standing around watching the stunt rehearsal and just, Oh, it was just horrible. It was horrible. <laughs> it is. It was so tough to watch. And I was watching it with my wife and, and my sister-in-law and I was just like, oh my gosh, like. Yeah, and we, and we felt like watching it. And so then we got into it ourselves and we, you know, we did all of the scene obviously first and then we did the sort of, you know, um, last moment of that scene into the stunt part separately. Um, but when it came into that single shot, yeah, we did it um, a number of times. And on the third occasion, there was sort of a plan where I would, just as he was grabbing the pillow, I would turn my head. And then when he put the pillow down, I'd be able to breathe. Um, but I just mistimed it and I didn't get my head turned in time. So he actually oh, no. won. No. Wow. What was, um, how, how would you let the other actor know, like, hey, I'm actually having trouble here? Like, he had, like, I think it was like a thumbs down or something, but for like a minute because I'm British and I don't like wasting time. I'm like, I think it's going to be fine. I think I can get out of this. I think I can. And then I was fighting and obviously Chris was, you know, we were really physically kind of fighting, you know, as much as we're not, you know, hurting each other, but it was like that real, you had to have that real kind of struggle. And anyway, I just then realized I couldn't breathe at all. Um, and so I sort of did the thumbs down thing and then we cut and we were ready, getting ready to go again. And then suddenly all of a sudden I just felt so sad and uh i don't know if it was like freaked out or if it was just the reality of this being something that's just again tragically commonplace and happens all the time um 
And yeah, it was just really, really rough. And then I think we tried, to, we, we sort of went to set up to do another take and we didn't do it or something like, you know, we had it. Um, but it was definitely, it was horrible for Chris to do, you know, just one of those things where like, actually the majority of your work as an actor is no matter how rough it is, is generally incredibly good fun. And that was the case with most of this, but that was the one day on set that was just like not remotely fun. <laughs> just I, could, I, I remember watching it and like, when it ended, I looked down and like um, I was like clenching my hands, like my whole body was like tense, and I was just like, <laughs> and I was like, "Is it done?" Like I didn't know. Like, I was just, oh, I was holding it was my so breath. intense. Yeah, I, I was like, even like afterwards, I was like, "Okay, like I'm waiting for her to move." Right. And I was like, "She's pretending, like she's, yeah. you know, she's playing an act, like she's, oh, she's actually dying." And then I honestly wasn't convinced she was dead until. You know, you cut to the next morning and she's on the bed still right. in the same position. And I was like, oh, my God. I was like, yeah, and that that match cuts wild yeah. as well. Right. You know, the thing is about that is that, of course, you really, you know, making a movie like this, that that's what the audience is going to think. In spite of the fact that we did a real time, you know, the reason it's two and a half minutes is that's how long it would take, you know. And so, you know, you're kind of mounting up the proof that it's real. But really it's actually kind of not until um the hand in the in the bonfire that people really understand that it's real and it's and it's interesting you know it's playing with all the we did a kind of fatal attraction shot above you know o over al's over chris's shoulder on the pillow you know so we're, we're kind of encouraging the expectation that she's going to sit back up but of course she's not. This is the this is where the kind of fantasy of a movie and reality kind of collide because, you know, we want it to be safe. We want it to be, we want there to be a win, but there isn't so often in life. So I think it's important, it's a hugely important moment in the film that we see that, we see the reality of that. And also in other movies, this would have happened right at the beginning. And it would have been through Al and Joe's, you know, we get that scene the next morning. We get the scene of like, oh fuck, what do we do? And it's kind of like a bawdy bro comedy. Now, why is the fucking stripper dead? I told you. Well, how did this happen? <laughs> what we're not used to seeing is a, the woman who is murdered be the center of the story. It's devastating because we love Cassie and we're so used to women's bodies just being the kind of inciting instant to something else rather than the whole story, I guess. So, yeah, I mean, it was, but it was incredibly, you know, it just, I mean, Carrie is very modest um, saying that she's British. She's just unbelievably committed and wouldn't let anyone else do it. <laughs> and even played her own corpse the following day. <laughs> day in bed, it was stock still on a day she didn't have to come in. Wow. wow. And, you know, and it was incredibly dangerous because of course, if she had, you know, if we hadn't had the, the kind of safety gestures and things, which, you know, thank God, obviously we would all, always had, it is, that is how long it takes to suffocate someone. So, you know, she was doing a stunt that really was life-threatening actually, because we all could have been watching and not known that it was actually happening. Emerald, what, um, what inspired this, this film? I don't know. Well, it's so difficult. It's so difficult to know how something comes to you. I think the part of it was I really wanted to, you know, make a revenge movie or like a sort of subverted revenge movie with a real woman in the middle. Because I, I'm really interested in how women can be genuinely scary. Um, we don't often see it. And I think that Cassie, for all that she is amazing and funny and great, she's also really scary. And she's really scary because you just don't see her coming. And the thing that she does, I mean, we, we sort of joked a lot that, you know, a lot of people would rather be shot in the leg than just be shown irrevocably that they're not good. Mm. And that there's someone out there who knows that they're not a good person. And that's just, you know, it's horrifying for all of us. Yeah. <laughs> Emerald and Kay, what was, what would you say is like the most challenging part of making this movie? And was there ever like, you know, you know, everyone, you know, you learn from your mistakes. Was there ever a big mistake that happened and it was like, it was really hard for you to overcome, but ultimately made you a better director and actor? I'm thinking, I mean, I think, do you know what? It's so, 
it was so much more general than that. I think it was that it was that we'd been determined to make this movie feel very cinematic and that it was going to look, you know, that it was going to be very contained, very static, very formal, formally shot. And that stuff just takes so much time, you know. The only time we use Steadicam is when Cassie's kind of losing control, whether that's like with Ryan and kind of falling in love or with the car when she's smashing it. Like, you know, and every day, every time we use Steadicam, which was very sparely, we just thought, oh God, this would have been so much easier. Um, but I think that the fact that it was so hard was, you know, was good in the end. It was just every single day we thought we weren't going to make it and we did. You know, and that was like really right up until the end. If we dropped a single scene, we couldn't have, there was nothing. There was no safety net. There was no time. So, wow. Yeah. Right. Because what did you say? 23 days? Yeah. That's wow. insane. Wow. So yeah, you really had no room for error, huh? <laughs> oh man. What about you, uh, Carrie? I don't know. I mean, I think it was more fun than I've had on anything probably in my whole career. <laughs> I did saying to Bo Burnham, like on day three, I was like, God, is this your job? <laughs> like, I've just been making these terribly sad films for so long. <laughs> what have I been doing? Um, so I loved, I loved how, you know, I loved how fun it was. I loved being surrounded by comedians. Um, I think it was, it, a lot of it was sort of, you know, sort of the feeling that trust in Emerald and being able to be instinctive and not overthinking things and not kind of trying to, you know, it, it did feel like it was all very natural and and that was so much of just brilliant writing, but then working with someone that just had such a handle on things. Um, and I think it has definitely, I mean, you know, it just it's just massively raised the bar for me in terms of stuff in the future because, you know, this experience was just in, an incredible role, an incredible film, an incredible director. Like, it's just, you know, I just don't, I don't want to do anything else now. <laughs> just find it hard to... You know, and it was just so different and it was new writing. It was just so much about it that was so extraordinary. So it's it's definitely raised the bar of, you know, stuff going forward and changed the way that I think, you know, changed, I think, a little bit the kind of stories that I want to tell. And so, yeah, it had a big, big impact. Going, going back to that scene that you guys broke down for us, at the end of it, um, Cassandra takes her gum out and sticks it under the table. Was that written in the script? That was all Cario. She's such a genius in almost every conceivable way. And that's the perfect example because it's just the perfect amount of callous, and childish and wonderful. You know, it's just, it's all the things that Cassie is in one movement. And that's just why, yeah, I can't even imagine this film without Carrie. I think it would have been impossible. Did you allow Carrie to do any like improvisation on set? Because it seemed like some of the lines had changed just slightly, you know, um, even, you know, cutting out entire, you know, little bits of dialogue. But w were those in the rewrites or were those just like on set decisions you guys made? A lot of it was in the edit. You know, we found we, we, we were just way, way, like I think a lot of people always do, we were way over. And so some of the kind of longer scenes, like devastating that it was, because it's so plot heavy, this movie, every scene is a kind of you know, an advancement of the thriller plot. So uh, yeah, so we had to just kind of cut things down, but absolutely there was a bit of improvisation, um, not a huge amount, just because it ha it's quite, because Cassie is very careful about what she's looking for and the phrasing and all of this sort of stuff. So, it, but, but certainly in scenes like, you know, the dinner party, I sort of said to everyone, like, just like, let's have a bit of awkward, stilted dinner conversation. I noticed, um, yeah, sorry, in that dinner scene, I noticed uh, Cassandra smiling. Was that really Carrie smiling, <laughs> like for real? Because she couldn't, she couldn't keep staying in character. <laughs> I couldn't deal with it. I was, they had to, they had to at one point I had to move me because my shoulder was shaking. So I was even, <laughs> even like, opening shots that That's wasn't awesome. in. Um, but yeah, I couldn't, Jennifer Coolidge, like just, she's <laughs> next level. I couldn't handle it. I was, I was just like that. That's gotta be a genuine like smile. Like you're really breaking character right there. <laughs> yeah, it's really funny. I would never normally do that. Cause I think it's a, I think it's sort of, yeah, it's not, it's not really fair on, Carey and it's maybe not necessarily true to the character but what was so brilliant about that and beautiful about that moment is it really does feel like the only time in the movie 
that we get to see the person who has, you know, who's lost. And, and so it felt so incredible to have something so supremely different that it does feel like a different woman for a second. Um, and it, yeah, it is. It's just, it's just wonderful. Emerald, how was it like, cause you've acted in plenty of, plenty of projects. Like what was that transition? Like, do you think it helped you being an actor and then going into directing? You did, was, do you think it was, uh, that helped you at all? I don't know. It's so hard to tell. I think so. I mean, I, I would hope so. I think certainly I understand how difficult it is and how, uh, yeah, and, and I think actors have the least amount of time or everyone else takes their time. Shots take forever to set up and then people have to come in and do something, you know, immediately, perfectly under the scrutiny of, you know, 100 people who are all kind of standing around, like, hoping they'll just, like, do it and then they can move on. Um, so I've sympathised with that stuff enormously. And I think, yeah, I, I think there are lots of things I've learned over the years that have you know, I think have made me comfortable at least. So then that's been helpful to try and extend that to other people. But also I suppose there's a kind of combination of admiration I have and also maybe slightly strict headmistressy. I also know that it's not magic. You know, there are people like Carrie who are magic, who are really exceptionally gifted and brilliant, of course. But I think there's a lot of... Um, yeah, there's a lot of hiding behind a acting mm -hmm. as a profession um, that I that I maybe have less time for. And so, uh, yeah, so I think that's useful because I can kind of tell when somebody's genuinely anxious and somebody's just fucking around because, yeah. kind of, <laughs> you know, it's sort of like, uh, so, it's, so I think that's a useful thing too. Like, I'm just incredibly sympathetic up to a point. And then I guess after that point, I'm like, okay, let's like get it together. <laughs> but on the next, so it was really... You know, in general, it was not necessary because everyone was so brilliant. That's great. Emerald, um, so were you saying, did you have, did you guys write the uh, music beforehand? Like, uh, like you, do you had that, uh, that toxic rendition, right? Is that, was that like something that really inspired how the, the vibe of this movie is going to play out? No, I mean, I had a, a lot of the songs were in the, you know, Stars are Blind and X, Charlie XCX and as Carrie says, something wonderful. They were in the script and I knew that Toxic obviously had to be there somewhere. Mm -hmm. The voted Britney obsessive fan. Uh, it was just a matter of, of where and um, in the edit, it was originally going to be a kind of bit of original composition, but that moment needed something sort of very specific. And so I found a string quartet on YouTube, a kind of an amateur string quartet who'd done Toxic and then slowed it down. Mm -hmm. So it had that kind of like unpleasant thing. And so once we realized that's what we wanted, uh, you know, we had amazing Anthony Willis, the composer, you know, compose, compose a piece that was perfectly timed so that we had every piece of Toxic together, but that once it was slowed down, would even you know, we could kind of fit it into that thing so it was sort of quite kind of complicated but yeah music in general is hugely important but that was kind of one of those i think happy kind of things. it was a great rendition it was like yeah oof. it was it was yeah kind of like, didn't recognize it at first i was like i know this song i know mm -hmm. it like trying to put my finger on it well lots of people don't know that it is slowed down i think because it feels it just feels like it's being played slowly but it but slowing it down gives it kind of unpleasant right, you know, very it's, eerie it's, feel yeah it feels a bit gross too and weird yeah i love the i love the whole soundtrack in this movie the, the score was awesome yeah that was beautifully done beautifully done carrie and emerald is there some some advice you could give to anyone listening who's trying to break into the industry well i don't know it's so difficult i'm so kind of hyper aware of how lucky i was to you know i got an agent at university and I also had parents who lived in London who could you know I could live in their house for two years while I you know tried to get a job so it, it's sort of I'm, I'm always like very careful to like caveat any advice I have with with you know, how unfair the advantage I had was mm -hmm. you know, honest. I started writing books at the same time as acting so I wrote three books in England and um, I'd written tons of stuff for that whole book, 100, 100 
thousand pages of a book um, that was terrible and turned down rightly by everyone um, and hundreds of scripts that were just awful. So, you know, it is like a very boring thing, but, you know, it's particularly with the writing, it's just doing it. It's not not doing what is so tempting, just um, reworking the same thing again and again and again and again and getting stuck on that first paragraph, stuck on that first page, that first scene, but just doing it and not expecting it to be good mm-hmm. at first, expecting that the first 10 things you write are really going to be shit because they probably will be, but they'll also mean that you can make something really really good yeah how many drafts were there emerald for this yeah not many when it comes to my when it comes to sort of things i rather than like killing eve for example or drifters where i was working with and for other people um uh if, if something like this i will just do i i i just write it in my head for two years so i never ever write anything down until it's finished. So I kind of draft, I draft and draft and draft in my head. So, I mean, thousands probably. Wow. <laughs> I've never heard of this before. Wow. That's amazing. That's, that's a great skill to have. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great memory. <laughs> Sorry. One no. quick. Sorry. Oh, I was one a question for Carrie. I just wanted to bring it back up, up, you know, while we're talking about the script, but what was, you know, Carrie, what was your reaction reading the ending of the film on the script? Like, I mean, I think the same as, a lot of people who watched the film, um, I, I was expecting her to sit up. I thought she was going to be fine. I thought something would, you know, I think it was that that's the, that's what you all hope for. You all hope that it's not going to end that way, but it felt so honest and felt truthful. And I think the thing about this film was that, you know, there was, there was this sort of heightened quality to it with the music and the set design and the costumes and the makeup and all of that made it feel like something else, but actually what Emerald was so kind of steadfast about was the truth underneath all of that. And actually everything about Cassie's story, everything about, you know, the way that she enacts her revenge or the mission that she's on, it's always truthful. And uh, and that that was the that was the honest way, you know, as soon as she was, as Emerald said, as soon as she's in the room with a weapon, um, it's just, you know, that's that's statistically what we know happens. So uh, yeah, I felt, you know, like it was the right thing. Um, and I think there was, there wasn't another way really, um, particularly once we were, and then once we were playing it, you know, particularly, you know, cause we did shoot chronologically to a degree, um, as much as we could. So that was the last thing that we shot. Awesome. Congratulations yeah, again. Congratulations yeah. on Promising Young Woman. Thank you so much for joining us. I know yeah, you guys got to go. what you guys do next together. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Yeah, have a good one. Love you. Thank you. Bye. See ya.